I am your host, Aaron Heath. I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode 49 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 049. Well, the gun of the show for this episode is the Taurus PT-1911. This is, in my case, my very first 1911. This is also a gun that I have a long history with that I don't think I'm going to go into on this episode. However, let me just say that this is a gun that it remains into my collection this to this day. Even though I have sold it, it has found its way back to me. It's the same gun. I'm not saying the same model. I'm saying it's the same gun. Now, this is the gun that I also learned that you don't carry in a nylon holster because this was the first gun I can still carry. This is also the gun that I uh, qualified with the first time I qualified for my concealed handgun license. Now, for those who are relatively new to the concealed handgun process, they may be saying, well, you only have to qualify once. That's true, but it always wasn't. Or it wasn't always. Let me rephrase that. You see, back in the day, every time you renewed, you had to requalify, and then they changed it to where it was every other renewal. And now, there is no requalification required. How cool is that? Now, the Taurus PT-1911 has seen a number of variations over its production life, with the first being the 1911B. The 1911B was the original Taurus PT-1911. It was blue. That's what the B stood for, as far as I know. And originally, it came with a Heine Straight 8 night sight, or it came with Heine Straight 8 sights. I was getting ahead of myself. There was a model available that had the night sights. And in late 2008, Taurus switched over to the Novak 3-dot sight system. Variations include versions with rails, a stainless steel version, versions with night sights, wood grips, uh, even two-tone finishes and different calibers. I mean, there are a lot of variations on the PT-1911. The modern version of the gun that I have is the featured gun of this episode, or the gun of the show, is the 1911FS. Now, the specs on the 1911FS are that its model number is the 1911FS. I don't know why Taurus does their model numbers like that, but who cares? It is chambered in 45 auto, has a capacity of 8 plus 1, and it is an extended magazine. So so basically, you are getting the reliability of a 7-round flush fit mag. It's just, it's extended out to make it reliable and hold 8. Not the best magazine for concealed carry, but who cares? After all, if you carry a gun with the factory magazine, and it's a 1911, you may be... You may not be carrying the gun in the best condition possible. I'm a big fan of aftermarket magazines that meet certain specifications when it comes to 1911s. Basically, if it's a there's a gentleman on the 1911 forums called 1911 Tuner. If the magazine is tuner approved, then I'm willing to carry it more than likely. Of course, I have to take each of the magazines that I use as a carry magazine and test it. That means a lot of ammunition. Sometimes it means new springs uh, more frequently for the carry mags. Okay, it means new springs very frequently for the carry mags, but that's beside the point. And we're getting off topic. Like all 1911s that are true 1911s, the gun is a single-action gun. Now, my gun has the Heine Straight 8 night sights. Now, from the factory, it came with the Straight 8s, although the current 1911FS features the uh, newer Novak sights that are used in the Taurus guns. Now, the material in this gun is steel and plastic. The grips are plastic. It weighs in at 38 ounces, and the MSRP, at least on the 1911 FS, is $684.40. I would like to take a moment and say the usual that I say about the uh, MSRP not being a true street price, and I would also like to point out that, like I usually do, MSRP can change between me recording this and you listening to it. It depends on when you're listening to it. With that said, let me run the audio that tells you how to get the podcast, and then I'll be right back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Okay, we have some listener feedback for this episode. To kick things off, Albert C. wrote in about episode 48, where basically I discuss Open Carry Texas supporting Senate Bill 142, or 124. Sorry, 
I kind of got some numbers switched around there. Now, he explains that he, too, supports the build. I think that's what he does. I mean, his email is very, uh, well, it's laced with a lot of profanities. Let's just put it that way. But basically, uh, he's telling me I'm wrong because I don't agree with Open Carry Texas. You see a lot of people that think this way. If you don't agree with the leader that's currently leading the open carry movement, then you're wrong. Well, no, not really. And if it does mean that I'm wrong, in that case, I'd rather not be right. I don't like the current leader of the open carry movement in Texas. I have been accused of being anti-gun because I said if he had a concealed handgun license, it would be best for him to take and um, prove it. And we're still having issues with each other to this day over it. I don't care. Now, Matt and Carol sent an email regarding a rifle being given to them by an out-of-state in-law. Carol's father is planning to give Matt the rifle when he visits from out-of-state, and uh, I want to let them know that, to be perfectly legal, when he gives him the rifle, under federal law, he has to transfer it through a dealer because it's considered an out-of-state transfer. Now, if Carol's father moved to Texas and then gave him the rifle, that would be a different story. But if he's just here visiting and he wants to give it to him, well, he will have to go to an FFL, let the FFL log it into his bound book, then Matt can pick the gun up, do a background check, pay the fee for the transfer, and they can walk out. We have more email that came in and comments, but we're going to leave them alone because I really don't think I have any that I feel have not been covered on this episode or others. Okay, moving on. Show news and announcements. This is one that I'm kind of sort of on the fence about. You know what? I'm not even going to talk about that one yet. We're going to we're going to see where it goes first. But I do have a new feature I'm working on for the podcast, and after I finish doing my research, I'll make an announcement. Make an announcement about it. I'm fairly certain I'm going to do this though. However, our other news and announcement for the podcast is that I tentatively have a live episode scheduled for April 2nd of 2015. Now, this particular live episode will feature call-in, and hopefully I'll have some people interested in participating as a roundtable on the episode. Now, if you want to call in and be a guest on the podcast, well, April 2nd is going to be your chance. I will post more information on the website, gunrightsintexas.com slash live, the closer we get to the date. All right, it's time to let you know how to be social with the podcast and myself. So, here's the audio clip. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, in previous episodes, you've heard me discuss calls to action. In fact, when we had Charles Cotton on, that was one of the things we discussed was calls to action from the TSRA, the Texas Firearms Coalition, the NRA even. Well, the Texas Firearms Coalition has released a call to action, and a lot of people didn't know what to do, really. So, we're going to talk about that. And when you get a call to action, you're uh, they're needing you to call, email, fax, or mail your representative or your senator or the lieutenant governor or even the governor and let them know, hey, this is the position I am taking on this and I want you to support this position. Okay, you say it a lot nicer than that. You got to be, you got to be, you got to be a statesman when you do it. So even if you're calling someone you know is going to be against your position, I don't care if you know that they are 150% anti-gun. They are so anti-gun, they have their wife step up and help them be anti-gun. I don't care. You still got to be polite. You still got to be a statesman about it. And even if you don't agree with them, still be a statesman about it. Well, let's talk about how you get in touch with them. Well, often the calls to action will include phone numbers or fax numbers. And really, that's what you want to do. You want to send an email or you want to call them. Pref- not email. You want to send a fax or you want to call them. Preferably fax. But we'll talk about all that in a moment. Let's talk about snail mail. Snail mail being U.S. Postal Service. It can possibly be the worst option available in many cases. And that's because we do not have the ability to control once it's received or when it's received once we send it. If a call to action is a longer duration one and we know it's going to be a longer duration call to action, then 
yeah, snail mail might be the best one available because it shows how dedicated you are to the cause that you actually sat down, spent the time to write a letter, pay money to put a stamp on it, and drop it in the mailbox. If you're like me, that means a drive to the post office even. Now, when you when you do all that, it shows your dedication. It shows how far you're willing to go for the effort to promote your cause. And it also shows how far you're willing to go when it comes election time. Now, if the, the problem is, once you send the snail mail message, you run the risk of the legislators saying, okay, okay, we've had enough. Don't send us in. Don't, don't do this to us anymore. And, the, and, you know, the party that issued the call to action says, all right, we're good. Drop the, stop the call to action. Well, you've already sent your letter, and it shows up after the call to action has been called off. Well, okay, then you kind of see the problem there, I, I hope. However, there are other options. There are better options in most cases. The only real advantage that snail mail has over all the others is it shows a level of dedication that the others cannot match. And that's really what it all boils down to. But the problems with it extend be, the problems with snail mail extend beyond that because it can even get lost by the Postal Service. And in some cases, even though the call to action may not have been called off, it may, call, it may arrive too late to do any good. The call to action may be uh, running up until the moment of the bill, you know, up until the moment of the vote for the bill. Well, let's say your snail mail letter arrives the day of the vote. It gets put into the mail slot for that particular legislator. He goes, he votes, he's got the mail but he didn't read it before it went in. And that's a problem you have when you use snail mail. The next option, and probably the best one in most cases, is faxing. And the reason I say it's probably the best one, it's because it's probably the most effective. Faxing your position uses more resources and more time for the legislature. You see, it takes their paper, it takes their toner, or if you got a printer, or if you got a fax machine that still uses a ribbon, it uses, one, it uses their ink. But faxes, like snail mail, also take time to read. It takes time to sort them. And sometimes they are even forwarded to the legislature, or to the legislator that they're sent to because it makes a point very clearly. And, you know, that staffer says, oh, he needs to read this because this might be useful to him. So they hand it to him. Now, an another advantage that a fax has, if you're careful with your wording, there's no ambiguity. There's no misunderstanding it. If you're careful with your wording, you make sure your point gets delivered in a clear, concise manner, and that makes it even more powerful, just like a letter. Additionally, you tend to know if a fax is received or not when you send it, at least when you're using a fax machine. Now, there is a way to, to send a fax without a fax machine, and we'll discuss that in just a moment. However, let's consider something that a lot of people don't realize. Faxing, because of the resources it eats up on the receiver, can actually cause legislators to ask that the pressure be turned off and they get the message quicker if they have stacks and stacks and stacks of paper coming in because they do not cooperate with you or maybe they're not uh, standing to the position you want and now you're eating up their resources, you're eating up their time and now they want that to stop. So they give in. They tell them, look, I'm going to support this bill, so please stop the call to action. The party that issued the call to action sends out a... A cancellation request, everybody stops, the legislator's happy, the lobbyist is happy, the group is happy, and more importantly, the people that were faxing are happy because now they got their way. Now, there are problems with faxing. One of them is that it's slow and it does take time. Another problem is not everybody has access to a fax machine. Although with the internet, that's not really a problem. Now, internet fax services offer low cost, and some of them are actually free within certain limits or via ads that are included with the fax. I'd recommend staying away from anything that tries to sell the legislator anything when you send them a fax. Now, with these services, an advantage that they have over a traditional fax machine is these faxes can be sent from anywhere. You can send them from your mobile phone if you're willing to risk autocorrect changing everything you, you type and not being caught. Now, the third option is phone calls. Phone calls are less effective than faxes, but they are still effective enough to be considered. Phone calls can be damaging to our cause if the caller does not speak clearly and ensure they are understood. We have a large immigrant population in the county where I'm at. And one of the things that you often hear is when somebody is talking about a, you know, they're talking about a number and it becomes almost comical. They, they say 36. 
And when they pronounce it, it sounds like dirty, and I'm not going to finish the rest of the statement. You could probably figure that out on your own. Well, while that may be comical to us right now, it becomes far less comical when you're trying to communicate with your legislator or their staff, and they don't understand what you're trying to say. Maybe it's because of a noisy phone line. God knows I've encountered those before. I'm certain you have too if you ever used a phone, at least to talk on it. And phone calls can also be uh, disregarded from, uh, well, to a certain degree they can be. All they do is they make a tick mark, take down a little bit of information in case they want to call you back. Maybe. Sometimes they just want to know who called them. But you really run the risk that they just get a total. Everything you tell them, no matter how friendly or polite, you're almost always going to be dealing with a staffer. Now, the advantages to a phone call is that, well, they're easy to do, they're convenient to make, and you can literally be heard by the staff. And you're probably going to, if you do this enough, you'll probably get on the first name basis with them. And the fourth method we want to discuss is email. Email is probably the most ineffective method of contacting your legislators. The problem with it is that, well, it can be easily ignored, it can get eaten by the spam filter, and it's rather easy for the staff to delete either intentionally or accidentally. The only benefit you have with email is that it can be done quickly and it's very convenient. If email is your preferred method, then please do us all a favor, spend a little bit of money, and use an email to fax service instead. You can actually send an email to a fax email and fax service. It'll take that e email, convert it to a fax, and send it to the uh, target location. No fuss, no muss. And that's really the best way to make use of email, or at least in my opinion it is. But if you're going to email your legislators directly, then please don't get your hopes up that you're going to actually have any real success because you may get eaten by the spam filter, you may be ignored, you may even be deleted. Email is just ineffective, mostly because it's too easy to do. Now we're going to do a little bit of a Texas legislative update, but before I do that, there is a fifth way to, to uh, contact your legislator and that is to meet with them in person. If you just happen to be visiting Austin while they're in office, hop in and talk to them. Tell them, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm from your district, and this is where I want to be on this issue. Uh, this is where I want you to be on this issue. I really like what you're doing, and I really want to be able to support you fully when you run for re-election or when you run for higher office. You know, kind of let them know. You are a voter, and you will vote. But let's move on to our legislative update. And... The first one is a good case of good intentions possibly going bad, and that's Senate Bill 718. Senate Bill 718 was introduced so that people who don't want a CHL for some reason could get a permit to let them skip the background checks like a CHL allows. The problem with that is that this bill can be easily modified so that it becomes a requirement rather than an option like similar permits in states like Illinois. Now, House Bill 2405 is an attempt by Pancho Navarez to cripple the protection of the, uh, of the 30 6 sign that we enjoy here in Texas. This is nothing more than an effort to make Moms Demand Action happy with him and what I suspect is an effort to get Bloomberg money for his future campaigns. House Bill 2445 is a bill that we have been expecting. And to be honest, we need this bill in order to make life easier for anyone who opens, ca openly carries any kind of firearm. This bill eliminates the vague and dangerous provision in the disorderly conduct law that has been abused by law enforcement to, op to arrest open carry activists already. If you think it's bad now, imagine when somebody's openly carrying a handgun, even with a license, it's in a holster, and there's a police officer that thinks, I don't like this guy, or I don't like him openly carrying a gun. So they decide to arrest you, and they hit you with, wait for it, disorderly conduct. Well, if we eliminate that from the law, we are better off. We remove that option for abuse. And we really do need to do that. Then we have House Bill 2373. This bill is basically a waste of money bill. It is intended to waste money and time by creating a task force to study gun violence. Then it will make then the task force will make recommendations to alleviate said gun violence in Texas. The thing about this bill is it would stack the deck for promoting gun control in the next legislative session, something we don't want. We don't want to waste money, we don't want to waste time, and we don't want to help the anti-gunners in the next legislative session. So, let's just simply eliminate that bill. Basically, the anti-gun bills that we have discussed in this legislative update are House Bill 2405 and House Bill 2373. The pro-gun measure that we have discussed is House Bill 2445 
and the bill that we're concerned could be turned against us, even though it was filed with the best of intentions, is Senate Bill 718. With that said, I think I'm going to wrap up this segment of the show, run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me, and then we're going to go on to the news. Now, since I did the legislative update in the middle of the episode, after the music for the end of the show, I am going to talk about the live episode that's coming up. So here's the contact information, and stick around for the news, and then the sign-off music, so you can, uh, and then stick around after the sign-off music so you can hear the most important part. Well, not the most important part, but the, the preliminary plans for our April 2nd show. With that said, here's how to get in touch. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Okay, we're back for Gun Rights in Texas news. And in this week's episode, we're going to do two political stories, and then we're going to do one that's going to be filed in the miscellaneous category. I know I've been doing uh, shorter episodes lately. That's because it's just been real busy for me, and I do apologize. Our first story is where the Big Spring, Texas chapter of Open Carry Texas marched in an effort to raise awareness for the unlicensed open carry legislation, which is currently being pushed by Open Carry Texas and other organizations. No problem. I wish them the best. I just don't think it's going to pass, especially since Corey Watkins has gone off and opened his mouth more than once. Well, we have a second story that's out of the American Statesman. And this story kind of brags about the opposition to Senate Bill 273, and that opposition has been met in committee. Now, Senate Bill 273 is a bill that would provide penalties for municipalities that post invalid 30-06 signs. This bill would provide some teeth for the state preemption law that currently makes such signs a violation to post. Well, they're not really a violation. It's just that there's no legal basis to post them, and the state's or the state actually preempts them on the authority to ban guns, which is what these signs are intended to do. Now, as a point of interest, Senate Bill 273 is also the same bill that the call to action that I was discussing earlier that went out is about. If you're listening to this, check out the Texas Firearms Coalition and see if Senate Bill 273 is still active on a call to action. If it is, take the advice I gave you in this episode, go out there and listen to it or not go out there and listen to it, but go out there and put it to use. And then finally, we have our story in the miscellaneous segment. This is, this is really a criminal activity story. We have a story from Dallas where a 36-year-old man was shot and killed while outside taking pictures of the first snow he had ever seen. The victim was a recent immigrant to the United States, and, you know, it's sad that somebody can come over here after going through all the trouble this man went through in his home nation, and he gets killed by somebody that's, uh, well, they don't respect his rights. They don't respect his right to life. They do not respect his life. Now, some people might say, well, you're going a little close to the gun banners. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is it angers me that somebody that comes to this country is, he comes to this country, he immigrates here, and he's still defenseless, just like he was in his home country. He came over here for the opportunity. He never got that opportunity. Let's say that he had the opportunity to defend himself. Would it have ended differently? Who knows? But he would have had the opportunity, and that's what angers me. He didn't get the opportunity. All right. I think I am going to hit the sign-off music, then I'm going to come back and we'll talk about the next episode that's going to be done live. Not the next episode, but the next live episode. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. roundtable I did was a roundtable with members from the Texas CHL Forum. 
it worked out very well. You know, some folks may be wondering why was that important? Well, I think that was a good episode to let people see what average people thought. And I think it worked out well. It worked out so well, I want to do it again. I've been so busy, I didn't get around to do anything for this month. But with a month or so to work on it, guess what? April 2nd of 2015 at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. That's most of Texas. Just a little bit of the very western tip around El Paso's uh, in mountain time. But, you know, most of Texas, 7 p.m., we're going to do this. We're going to have the call-in number open. That's an 866 number, so it's toll-free if you're using a landline or a cell phone that doesn't give you unlimited long distance. And you know what? Just get ready to call. If you want to suggest a topic for that episode or if you want to be a, uh, to be a member of the panel that doesn't have to call in, you'll be on a uh, probably a, we'll probably do a Google Hangout again. And if you want to be a member of the Google Hangout panel in that case, also send me an email. If you want to send a suggestion for a topic or a request to be on the panel, send it to Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at gunrightsintexas.com. That's right, A-A-R-O-N at G-U-N-R-I-G-H-T-S-I-N-T-E-X-A-S dot C-O-M. With that said, this is going to be a very short episode. I'm thinking it's under 30 minutes. I've really got to get a clock in here again. So please stay safe and carry responsibly.